Uh, we're going to begin this morning by our word prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you thanks for this beautiful day you've got, you have given us. Lord, thank you for just waking us up this morning for uh, to have a taste of your mercies that are new every morning. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness and for the privilege that you've given me, Lord, to preach your word this morning. Lord, help us not to just think that even though this is just for a class, Lord, for a grade, that this is just a message that we just listen to, but let us just listen to this word and make an impact in our lives. Uh, Lord, especially uh, help me to move away from here and allow your Holy Spirit to proclaim the word. Lord, help my mouth to proclaim everything clearly, Lord, and be faithful to your word, O oh Lord. We give you thanks for your son, Jesus, uh, because that's ultimately why we're here, because you, Jesus, resurrected from the dead. And thank you because we have hope in you. Uh, allow us, allow us just to be attentive to your word and to see the beauty of scripture. And we see all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so let me begin with a story. A couple of uh, weeks ago, as I was studying for this passage, I stumbled upon this book called Proof. And in this book, the author is talking about outrageous grace. I know. Nobody here will say, man, grace is outrageous. But when you think about it, like God's grace is amazing. Like God's grace in the eyes of the world will see like that's something that is not worth investing for. But God did it. But in this story, the author is talking about this certain girl who had been adopted by this certain family. Now this girl, uh, you know, was misbehaving. She was not uh, behaving the way that she should. She was lying constantly. Uh, and this family that adopted her would do a trip to Disney World every single year. Like that's every kid's dream to go to Disney World. Uh, so they, they ended up going to um, Disney World. But here's the thing. Fla, fla, um, we're, I'm going to move back a little bit. They would always take their biological children, but they would never take their new adopted daughter. Now you would think, that's so mean to do. Why would they do that? Now leading up to the strip, again, she would always lie. She would always disobey her parents. She would always say things that she shouldn't. She would do things that she should have not done. And she would always be rebellious. You know, so every single year that they, they, they did that trip, they would always uh, just leave her with a family friend. Now, after a couple of rough years, this family decided, you know, to dissolve the adoption and to give this girl an adoption once again to another family. Now, this brand new family was a Christian family, loved Jesus. And every year, they also, with their biological children, they would go to Disney. But this time, they decided to take their brand new adopted daughter. You know, it was a beautiful uh, thing for her to hear that she was finally going to experience Disney. Now, once again, leading up to this trip, you would think this girl is going to get it together because she knew in the back, uh, way in the back times that she was not uh, going to Disney because of her behavior. But it was the opposite. She misbehaved again. She lied. She did things that she should have not done. She lied to her parents. She hit her siblings. But guess what? The parents decided to take her in spite of her behavior. So fast forward. That evening at Disney World, they were in the hotel, you know, after, for those who have been to Disney World, it's a beautiful day, but the humidity is so much in Florida. Um, the long lines, the overpriced food, you know. But that night, she was just so exhausted because she had, done an, she had, had an amazing day. Now her uh, adopter, her father came up to her, uh, kneeled down at her bed, and she was going to pray with her. But first she asked her, he asked her a question to her brand new adopted daughter. And he asked her, how was your first day in Disney? To what she responded, Daddy, I didn't go to, I didn't go to Disney because I was good. I didn't go to Disney because I was good. But because I am yours. Because I am yours. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you today about. I want to talk to you about a God who gave people something that they didn't deserve. So if you have a Bible, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to go to the Old Testament. That's what this, this is class is about. So Exodus 16. Um, and I'm, I want to talk about something really important about God's grace. Um, and I want you to know that God's grace is not something that you receive for being good. That's not something that you receive for something that you do. But rather some, a gift that you receive by being God's. A gift that you receive by being the children of God. 
So let me give you some context as you're looking in um, Exodus chapter 16. Let me give you some context. We all know, most of us are familiar with Exodus. You know, the Lord called ex, uh, Moses in chapter 3. And then fast forward, we see that um, the nation and the people of Israel were under slavery under the people of Egypt. Now in chapter 14, we know what happened. The Lord sent the 10 plagues to wipe an entire nation. It wasn't the nation. It was not the nation of Israel who did that. We see that in chapter uh, 14, the Lord parted the Red Sea so that people could walk in the middle. It was God. It was not something that Israel did. And then, you know, as they were in their journey, we see that the Lord provided a cloud during the day. And we see that the Lord provided light at night so that they could walk. Again, it was all God. It wasn't the people. So every single thing that they had received by this point, it was a gift. There's some, nothing that they had done. Now in chapter 15, as you read, it's a beautiful passage about praise and worship. It's a people just uh, thanking the Lord for what they had experienced, for what they had seen when they saw the Lord, the power of the Lord being displayed through uh, the people of Israel. You know, it's all about praise and worship. Thank you, Lord, for the things that you have done. Thank you for delivering us from the people of Egypt. But it is in this passage, it is in this chapter 16 where everything changes. When their praise becomes into panic and their, and their worship becomes into worry. So I want you to look with me at chapter 16. We're going to begin in verse 1. It says like this. Then they, talking about the people of Israel, set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Now, quick note, the wilderness of sin has nothing to do with our English word uh, that is sinful, even though the people were sinning, even though they were kind of a sinful place, it has nothing to do uh, with, with sin, what we would consider sin in our English word. But rather it has to uh, do with the, the word Sinai, with the word Sinai, Mount Sinai, the word sin, Sinai. But the, the meaning of this word is uncertain. Now let's keep going. They passed through the wilderness of sin, which is between uh, Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day on the second month after the departure from the land of Egypt. Now this is important. And I want you to have this as we go uh, about in our passage. They had been out of Egypt for only one month. Just one month, not four years, not five years, not 40 years yet. They had been out of Egypt only for one month, which it'll be important as we go along. Now look with me, verses 2 and 3. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumble against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Verse 3. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now here we encounter the first sin of the nation of Israel. Now here's what's interesting. This is the ironic part. They were saying, oh Lord, uh, you know, we could die right here. You know, we were in Egypt and we had all the food that we wanted. You know, back in Egypt we have Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, and now we are here and we just have nothing. We could just die right now. Why, why have you brought us here to die? Now that's ironic because if you look back, throughout Exodus, that's the least thing that you're going to see. The people were not like, they were slaves. They were not like those people who were like, oh, you know what, I'm just going to quit this job and maybe find a job in another part of Egypt. Like they were slaves. They were not allowed to choose what they wanted. Like the portion of the meal was probably super poor. But you know what? Because they were so hungry, they just complained. And it's interesting because maybe you, maybe this morning you woke up, you didn't have breakfast or you've had it in the past. And you go along, you come to the classes in the morning, and by 1 p.m., your stomach it starts to uh, make some noises, or maybe your stomach is doing that right now. By 1 p.m., you feel what some people would call hangry. Hangry, that's probably something that we're all familiar with, which is a bad combination between being hungry and being angry at the same time. And so the people committed this sin because they were hungry. Because they had thought that in Egypt, in Egypt or they had thought that being slaves, everything was going to be better. But it wasn't. And they complained to the Lord. Surely you would think, oh, we've seen the Lord um, just send ten plagues to wipe an entire nation. We can trust that God. Or you can say, oh, we've seen the Lord part an entire ocean so that we could walk. Like, n not a normal person can do that. Only the power of God. 
And you, surely you can think, oh, the Lord parted the sea. We can trust Him. Or you can think the Lord provided for us shade in the day of how, how warm uh, it was. And maybe the Lord provided shade and, uh, the light he, and the night He provided light. Surely we can trust that God. But they didn't. They didn't do that. They complained. Even though they had seen the power of God being displayed through it all. They decided to complain. Now you would think, like put yourself in, in God's shoes. If he had any shoes. But he, he doesn't probably. Like imagine, like, God just listening to the grumbling of his, his people, even though he had saved them from, the, from slavery, even though he had done all this thing, surely God could have been like, you know what, I'm going to rain fire and brimstone from heaven because they're complaining against me. I, he, can, he could have just snapped like that and just destroy and wipe an entire nation. But look at what he does in verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain fire and brimstone. No, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. Then I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. Whether or not they will walk in my instruction. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful verse if you think about it. Like God again, he could have easily rained destruction, fire to destroy these people. But he desired to give them a physical taste of his faithfulness. He decides to give them a physical taste of his grace and his mercy. And he decides to reign the very thing that the people of Israel didn't deserve. And I think we can all feel related when we complain. And maybe the Lord gives us exactly what we do not deserve. For what? Maybe we see in this passage, this is the main reason why he gives them what they wanted. Maybe not because, yeah, primarily because he is good and he wanted the people not to starve to death. But ultimately, we see in this passage that the fact and the reason the Lord provided the food was to test the people. To test their faithfulness so that the people could say at the end of this, you know, God, I can trust you. Like you are trustworthy. Like you provide bread for me. You've, still, you, you've done all this thing. Surely you, you'll provide my meal. And that's why the Lord provides the food. As we go along, as we go through the passage, we will encounter that Moses and Aaron were, were the leaders who, who were leading uh, the nation of Israel. They were the ones that had to communicate the message to the people of God. Now, it's interesting because I don't think we would do a good Moses. I don't think most of us, especially me, I, don't think, I think I would lose it right away. When people came up to me, people that I have helped, people that I have led and they come to me and they complain about the things that, that I've done like that will like be so frustrating for them I don't think we would do a good Moses but now we're gonna focus on Aaron for a little bit because Aaron was the one who was gonna share the message of God to the people he was the one who's in charge of telling the people that God was going to provide for them now put yourself again um, in Aaron's position you're about to give a speech to the entire people you're going to tell them what God was going to do. Now, Aaron was not going to speak to six people, ten people. He was not going to speak to 20 people or like this amount of this class or like a, a, a thousand people like a chapel. He was going to speak about the message of the Lord for 600,000 people or more. About what the message, about what the Lord was going to do to them. About what the Lord was going to provide for them. And that's what Aaron, as, as Aaron was speaking, they look on the wilderness and they see the glory of the Lord. They see the glory of the Lord because God loved the people so much that he was going to provide for them. In fact, look with me at verse 12. God is speaking and he's saying, I have heard the grumbling of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Here we see two interesting parts. First, we see that they will know that God is the one who is faithful. God is the one who is a God of all grace and mercy. It's interesting that he add, that the author adds, and you will know. Wouldn't you think that the people of Israel, after all they experienced, after all they had seen, after they had seen the power the Lord displayed, wouldn't you think that they should have already known that it was God who did all those things? What do you think that they should have already known that it was God who could, was able to provide their meal? But they didn't. And look at the end, uh, at the end of verse uh, 12. And they will know that I'm the Lord. It doesn't say the Lord God. He used an emphatic possessive. I am the Lord, your God. 
You know, that's something that probably the people could, could, could rest in the fact that God was just not a God who was in the heavens, but He was a personal God. Hey, I am your personal God that loves you and I'm going to provide for you. But you've been so disobedient to me. You've been grumbling so much that I'm going to use this actually because I love you, but I'm going to test you through this situation. But imagine the people just listening to his voice through air and through motion, through their messengers, that he was actually going to provide, that he was a God of mercy, that was, he was a God of grace. What a, beautiful what a beautiful truth for them to rely on. Now we see that the Lord sent some quills. I was, as I was studying this, I was trying to, to see what quails were. And there's like these kind of migratory birds that they would migrate from different places. And the Lord was going to send these birds so that they would provide the meat for the evening for the people to prepare and to cook. So that was the evening. And then in the morning, we'll see what we'll focus about this passage for most of our time. And he uh, provides this weird thing from heaven that it was for, hard for the people to distinguish. Now imagine yourself. Maybe I don't know if you are from Florida, from the, the, the state where it's just heat all year and you've never seen snow. Imagine if you're from a place where it's like, like that and you travel to Chicago, or you go to Alaska, wherever you see snow for the first time, just fall from the sky. You'll be like, what in the world is this? Maybe you've seen it from the news, you've heard about it. But it will be like weird to see this white thing coming from the sky. Now, for the people of Israel, it was like the same thing. They, were, they had seen something in the ground that it was hard for them to distinguish. In fact, look with me at what verse 15 says. When the sons of Israel saw it, talking about this thing in the floor, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord had given you to eat. You know, the Hebrew word for, I'm um, not a Hebrew scholar, but for those who are studying uh, Hebrew, the word for what is it is literally the English word for, um, sorry, is the Hebrew word man, uh, manhu. So if you're studying Hebrew and, the, and your teacher asks you today, you'll get an A right there. So it's the word manhu. And, and if you look at it, later on we'll see this, so I don't want to spoil it for you. But the word manhu it sounds familiar to the word mana. So this is what the people ask. So the word mana doesn't mean bread in Hebrew. It literally means, it's just a question. What is it? It's just a question. What is it? Imagine everyone told, what is it? What is it? What is it? Like for a thousand hours, just like people were just asking that question. Is What is it? That's what it is. And so the people of Israel saw this bread in the floor and they just call it, what is it? Now it's interesting that uh, Moses tells the people to gather this food. I don't know if you, when you were a baby, your parents maybe uh, used a spoon like a plane so that you could open your mouth to eat from the food. I was watching a video a couple of weeks ago of this mother on YouTube who went viral. And she was, uh, wanted to give food to her little baby, but she would not open her mouth. So what she decided to do is to grab a slice of pizza and kind of give it to her. And she opened her mouth and while she had her mouth open, just put the spoon of the other food in it. Now that's pretty mean to do, but here's the thing, Here, here's my point. God wasn't doing that with the people of Israel. He wasn't like, hey, I will give you the food in your mouth, open your mouth, here you go. He was actually, hey, I'll provide you the food, but it's up to you to gather it. You know, if you want it, awesome, here it is, don't starve to death. But if you don't want to eat it, then that's, your, that's on you. I'm going to provide you the food, but it's up to you, it's up to you if you gather or not. Now, after that, Moses tells them, hey, you know what? You can eat from this food you can gather every day, but please don't leave it until the morning because if you leave it until the morning, it's going to go bad. So again, just think about that. The nation of Israel listening to Moses, oh, okay, uh, so we are not allowed to gather. Uh, um, we are not allowed to keep it on a, on, a, on a box or something like that because we know that it's going to be bad for the next morning. But look with me what verse 20 says. But the people of Israel did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning, and he burned worms, and it became foul, and Moses was angry with them. Now, here we see the disobedience of the people of Israel. That was strike one. Even though we're not going to consider them grumbling right now, we're going to consider that's a strike one right now. They disobeyed the Lord by gathering food when Moses clearly told them not to do so and they gather the next morning. 
Now, look with me what happens in verse 21. They gather morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat, but the sun grew hot and it would melt. Now, it was to be a daily task. So the people grabbed the food, they just grabbed one, ate it, and then they had to wait till the next day that the Lord would provide more. But remember that, once again, the people disobeyed. So they said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. And the fact that they gather more for the next day, it was a demonstration that they didn't really trust the Lord. That they didn't trust the Lord that He was going to provide for the following day. So that's why they decided to take even more. And that was the first strike and their disobedience. Now we're going to go to verse 22. Now on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, verse 23, then he said to them, this is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath of servants, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. Now think with me. The sixth day was going to be different compared to the other rest of the days. The sixth day was going to be different. Now you got to understand, the people of Israel had never heard the word Sabbath before. This is the first appearance in the Bible because remember that the law had not yet been given yet and Moses had not been to Mount Sinai to speak with the Lord about the law. So when they hear about the Sabbath, Mostly had to explain them what it was. Remember that on the sixth day, you're going to gather extra. So I'm, I'm guessing the people, you know, are like, hey, today's the sixth day. I'm going to gather extra because I know that on the seventh day, the Lord is not going to provide because he wants us to rest. But I think more than that, the Lord wanted to cultivate faithfulness in their hearts. In fact, look with me, verse 26. Six days you shall gather what we were talking about. The sixth day, you shall gather extra. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath there will be none there will be none so remember the main reason the Lord provided food for these people is so that yeah they would see his grace and his mercy and that he is a good God that he's their father but more than that he provided the food so that they could cultivate trust to the Lord and now God is doing this Sabbath so that they can rest but once again, ultimately, so that they can trust in the Lord. Remember, they were not allowed to gather on the seventh day. But guess what? The people disobeyed the Lord. Strike number two. And we're told that they still went and gathered the next day. Oh, you know what? We're going we're gonna to gather tomorrow because I don't know if the Lord is going to provide. I don't think I trust the Lord too much, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go gather the next day. And so the Sabbath, a holy day for the Lord, they go and gather something that they knew that they should have not done. And Moses, once again, is angry. And the Lord asks, like, for how long are the people not going to obey my commandments? For how long the people are going to disobey me? But then we see that the people eventually rested. Maybe they figured out that God, that they could trust God, that he was going to be able to, to provide for them that day. Now look with me, verse 31. The house of Israel named him Mena. And he was like a coriander seed white, and his taste like... And its taste was like wafers with honey. Now we see in this passage that the people finally named it. And you remember that a couple of verses ago they, they were not able to distinguish what it was that in the ground. But they finally called it mena. Which if we just translate it, it literally means what is it? I don't think we have a lot of names with a question mark. Like what is it? You know, that's what they called the food. Now, here's the interesting part. The Lord told them that they were supposed to put this manna in a jar for the next generation. I think this is a beautiful picture uh, of, of what we're going to encounter at the end of, as we go into the application. Why, the people were probably wondering, why should we put a manna in the jar? I mean, we've seen a couple days ago the manna melts and they say, why, why, why should we put it in a jar? It's going to melt or it's going to get bad. But they trusted the Lord and they put it in a jar for what? So the next generations could see this and be reminded of God's faithfulness. So that the next generations could, see, could look back and see this and see how faithful the Lord has been. That the same God who provided for their ancestors is the same God who's going to provide for you. That the same God, you know, who is able to provide for us today here in 2019. The same God who provided for, for people 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago is the same God who can provide for us today. The same God who can provide 
for us today. And so they were told to put it in the Ark of Testimony. So in the future people, the priests will tell about the, the faithfulness of God through this jar with the manna in it. Now look with me at verse 35. I think this is important. The sons of Israel ate the manna 40 years. You know, imagine the people of Israel just all the manna for 40 years. I mean, I love this food, but, but I don't know if I can do it for 40 years. And we're told that they do it for 40 years. Like, let's put it into perspective. I, I, I think if I ask right now if to raise your hand if you like a Krispy Kreme donuts or any type of donuts, I think most of your hands will be up. If you don't like donuts, we'll pray for you after the message. But I, I can imagine, like, I, I would say that most of us would say that donuts are awesome. They taste awesome. But let's put it into perspective. Would you eat Krispy Kreme donuts for 40 years every single day? Ricky's like, I would do it. But imagine eating the same thing for 40 years. Or let's put it into perspective here in school. I think that we will have our difference when it comes to the SDR. I think it's good. But four years is more than enough. Like imagine eating from the SDR, and there's a variety, variety at the SDR. It's not the same thing every day. There's different parts. But imagine eating from the SDR for 40 years. For 40 years. That's way too long. I, I can just think, imagine uh, the people of, of, of Israel, like eating the manna the first year. Oh, wow, this is kind of getting a little bit repetitive, you know. Now the second year, oh, you know, I'm a little bit years. In that two years, it wasn't 10 years, 20 years, but 40 years. Imagine eating the same thing for 40 years. But I think, you know, the Lord could have just rained steak. The Lord could have rained whatever He wanted from heaven every single day for 40 years. But He put the same thing so that the people could rely on Him and know that He's faithful. But even though, even if the Lord would have sent Chipotle or steak or Chick-fil-A from heaven, probably people would have complained anyways. But the Lord decided to give them manna for 40 years. Manna for 40 years. Now, we are told that they did that until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now, let me ask you something. What are you grateful for today? Just think after. What am I grateful for? Are you only grateful for the big things that the Lord has given you? Maybe a car, maybe a beautiful house, maybe for the family that you have. Awesome things. But, <coughs> but are you <coughs> also grateful for the small things that the Lord has given you? Are you also grateful for the things that can fit in a jar? You know, I firmly believe that we all should have a spiritual jar where we put all the blessings that the Lord has given us. Or maybe you think, you know, we should actually have a physical jar. Maybe that's something I've heard that people have that. And in their room, they have a jar and they write a paper about what the Lord has provided for them. And they put it in that jar. And they call it the, manna, the jar of manna. And what a beautiful thing, you know, whenever you're doubting to look back. Whenever you're doubting God's grace, whenever you're doubting God's provision to look at that jar and realize how faithful God has been to your life. That He was able to provide your financial needs here in the school. That He was able to provide uh, money for you to have when that day you thought you were not going to have food. That the same God who provided for the Israelites thousands of years ago is the same God who can provide for you. The same God who parted the sea, who holds the stars in the sky, is the same God who can provide one meal for you every day. Now, I think that the spiritual nourishment is the most important thing. In fact, our spiritual nourishment is way more important than our physical. That we should be more concerned about the spiritual things than the physical things. And I think that the Israelites back then, they were so concerned about what they were going to eat that they neglected their relationship with the Lord. In fact, and with this I'm going to finish, in John 6, you know the passage. Jesus is talking to the Jewish people. After they had, he had provided a food for a multitude of people. And this is what happens. Jesus tells them, You know, your ancestors, your fathers, ate from the manna, yet they died. Your fathers ate from the manna, yet they died. And what was his point? At the end, he's like, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats from this bread will live forever. And now what's my point? I, th I firmly believe that on a daily basis, morning by morning, not necessarily literally, you don't have to do it in the morning, you can do it now, but I think day by day, the same way people were gathering morning by morning, we should gather and feed on Christ 
through our relationship with the scripture. Because here's the truth. I'm preaching this for a message, and it'll be recorded, and this will be for a grade. But at the end of the day, this is the book that we, uh, if you maybe didn't pay attention for anything I said, this maybe pay attention to this. This is the thing, the most important book that you can um, just have nourishment from. Yeah, books from Calvin are awesome. Books from Duluth are awesome. But at the end of the day, they didn't die for you. Jesus did. He gave us his word so that we can be nourished by him, so that we can feed on him through his daily word, so that we can read it, meditate in it, and not upon his word. And I firmly believe that that's what God wants us to do today. Thank you.